Assalamu alaikum, welcome to another episode of AccidentalMuslims.com. Tonight's guest is described as dynamic, driven, and an innovative senior management consultant with extensive experience in the digital disruption across the public and private sectors in Africa. With over 17 years experience in delivering projects, adept at developing solutions to complex problems and acting as a catalyst for change to transform economies, promoting industrial development, investment, competitiveness, whoa, and employment facilitation. Farana, is this you? I had no idea who you're speaking about. <laughs> well, to the guests out there, Farana Ali is here with us this evening. Shukran for being here. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And uh, yeah, Allah bless you and enjoy this evening. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, lovely stuff with us today is Amir Alika, the so Prince of Gatesville. <laughs> <laughs> and Aisha Bibi Khan, uh, fellow co-host here this evening. Aisha, how are you? I'm well, alhamdulillah. You excited for this evening? I'm a resume really like this. A lot of big words here. So we're going to find out this evening what those words are about. I'm, I'm still going to start with, because that's all the big words. Oh, okay. But okay. I'm still going to start with asking you who is the Amalista. <laughs> you carry on with that. <laughs> so I think, first of all, um, what's important is... I've always found myself or would like to believe that I'm strong, independent, and I think w that I'm still young um, and very focused in achieving what I want in out of life. Um, I'm currently a director for a company called African Ideas, and we'll go into that a bit later. I'm also a director for a non-profit company called Partnership for a Digital Africa, which is focused on creating innovative platforms across various societies and organizations. And I'm about to venture into a whole new business in the realm called Akile Digital, which is all about enabling business empowered through, um, sorry, enabling businesses through powering through digital. So that that's quite a bit, yeah. It, it's all over. Um, so I'm quite excited in terms of my new venture in the digital sphere. Where did you say the name of uh, Akile Digital? Akile Digital. Yeah. Okay, so so what led you to this part? How did you um, take us maybe through schooling? I know you said you know Khalil from high school. You can so, 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 so schooling <laughs> was, um, Khalil and I have, have a very long-standing friendship. Um, Khalil was my cricket coach. Yes. <laughs> and he was tough, very tough. Um, yeah, and that's how I met both Khalil and Aziza on the cricket pe uh, pitch many days. Um, started all my schooling life was in the islands. I've never lived in the islands, which is okay. fascinates me. Um, I started out at um, Habibia Preschool, mm -hmm. like most islanders. Um, then went on to Turfel Primary, um, a very proud Turfel Primary uh, Tefillin and um, or Turfelite that keeps changing over time. <laughs> yes. And then at Rylands High, I'm currently serving on the Rylands High alumni, mm -hmm. and I'd like to also use this opportunity to ask all ex islanders contact me if you want to go back and support your roots. I think it's important. Um, I'm the eldest of four. Um, my brother Shakir, sisters Laika, Nurul, Ain and Munira are my world. And then I have my blessed parents, both Shafi and Shanaz, who are the Leila and Majnu of our lives. Um, and they are my absolute happiness. Um, married to Anwa, who is joining us in the room today, but too shy for the camera, he you, leaves that to me. <laughs> um, and Anwa and I share a friendship of about 21 years, so he was the only man strong enough to say, let me put up with this girl. <laughs> <laughs> My family did try and talk him out of it, actually. But yes. yes. He, would see, he stood his ground, that's a true story, he would stood his okay. ground and said, I'm going to marry her. Alhamdulillah, um, next week will be four years. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, okay, so so this um, so your profession. What what is it that you know got you interested in it? What is it that you do? Let's maybe start with that and then tell us the journey of how you got. So here. I think everyone who knows me knows that I can't sit still, which is a personality trait of mine. Work is my life. Most people say it's unhealthy. I know where the balance and the passion lies. Um, I started out, I've, I've got a postgrad and master's in public relations. Mm -hmm. I've never worked as a public relations practitioner, first of all. So that for me demonstrates that it's not always what you do that takes you on the path that you lead. Um, I started out always wanting to be an investigative journalist because I wanted to go and cover the war stricken countries. Um, danger and drama follows me everywhere. I'm like a natural for it. We went to Durban over the weekend, and as we were walking to Chatsworth Centre, there's a bomb screen. It only happened to Farana. So, 
uh, Mahmoud Sangle, who, who guided me through some investigative journalism back in the day. Um, and I thought this was the path. Mm -hmm. And somehow it all took a twist. I ended up in government. I've worked for government for over 11 years before going into consulting. I uh, found myself working on the Western Cape Broadband Initiative, one of the biggest projects in the province. Mm -hmm. um, three billion rand project over three years to connect all of government facilities via, via fiber and Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And I was responsible for what was then known as the Connected Community Stream. All about enabling digital and how we can um, close the divide, the digital divide in the communities. So it was a uh, project managed and instrumental in what is known as the ICANN Center in Alsace River, mm -hmm. as well as the Kalicha Bandwidth Barn, and found a passion for technology and what it can do for us as individuals. Mm -hmm. Not just thinking it's a PC or a laptop, but how it can empower you and give you something that you didn't necessarily, necessarily know that you can own. Simple, effective, cheap, um, and that's, that's how it all changed. Um, so I currently run some large-scale projects across some big telco companies, um, community-driven initiatives. We're also a Google collaborator. and was actually the project manager on a big Google project to train 5,000 people in Google, free Google training. Mm -hmm. So we've been calling out on communities and saying, we provide the training for free, no catch. There are some things in life that are for free. Mm -hmm. And all you need to do is provide a venue and the people. Um, so there's a whole host of different projects from software installation through to um, establishment of products. So as a P4DA, this is one of the products we're busy selling at the moment. It is 300 Rand. It's a panic button currently made in China with an app. Now, I'm not trying to sell a product. The reason I want to bring this up is we self-fund everything. So we are now self-investing in having a local developed app that supports a product of this nature because we've taken over a year to go out to market to say, how do you find something that's cost effective that our people can understand? Mm -hmm. Because often you give us technology and we're like, but where do I start? Mm -hmm. So we've tried to simplify things and we've tried to make things local. So we, we are based in observatory and it's all about product development. We've got a robot in education. Um, it's a robotic kit for education called Rocky. We're looking at agriculture, um, vertical farming, um, a farming application. Mm -hmm. We've got smart home devices. And the reason I'm saying all of this is I actually want people to come and engage with me and how we can get communities to come on board and empower themselves through this. It's not just always about business. It's also about how do we learn and connect. I know that's a mouthful. I talk no, a lot. No, that's, that's quite amazing. What, what work do you see yourself doing in, in communities? What is it that you... So I... I'm, they always laugh at me because I always call, um, refer to myself as the glue. I'm a facilitator. Okay. You know, I don't specialize in anything. I'm not technical. I'm not the smartest smarty in the box, but I'm glue. So that's what I do. I can hold anything and anybody together, alhamdulillah. It's really a gift and a passion of mine. And that's what I do. It's about, I go into communities. I've worked on large-scale uh, a USDDA funded project for city of Cape Town where I worked in all the different townships looking at how we can uh, understanding the digital needs um, and that so for me it's about saying it doesn't matter what race you come from what religion you come from I always get teased they always say you were young Muslim Indian girl went to a Catholic school sitting in a church in the middle of Kailicha and yeah. that's cool because you need to relate on a human level. So that's what's important to me. Okay. Is technology scary? Why do people think technology is scary? Especially age groups 35 upwards maybe. So just something I mentioned to you yeah. earlier around that. And, and the biggest reason being is because people are scared of change. And the most important lesson learned through all of these projects is that we don't create awareness. Mm -hmm. You want to tell someone how this works. And you want to tell them how it's good for you. Mm. But you don't make them aware of why they need it. And you need to also understand their environment. It's not your environment. So technology is not scary. It's how you read technology and what you do with it. Um, it's also about understanding that someone created it. It's not God made. Yes, God gave someone the idea to create it. So why should you be intimidated by something that was not made by the all-knowing mm. and all-being? You you can easily figure it out. It doesn't take a rocket science. In our home, dad is YouTube Ali, mommy's WhatsApp queen. They figured it out. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, I think this must have my parents. That's the uh, first time I uh, <laughs> YouTube Ali. Okay, interesting. We was interviewing with her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But I know that's actually a very um, good answer. An answer that I was looking for because I'm I'm myself who, when the technology boom was happening uh, around 2000, mm-hmm. uh, the 90s, I think they called it. Um, I was af- I would say I was afraid to experiment. Um, today's youth are not afraid. I mean, my 13 year old nephews they they way ahead i think they make some sometimes they make even fun of my wife uh, because mm-hmm. of her lack of te- technology skills but it's certainly the youth has taken on to these uh, new techni- techni- technology advances wow what, what is attractive about technology for the youth and and certainly there's some sort of responsibility that comes with it as well i think you mentioned it in what you were saying and for something i was thinking about earlier is that the youth of today are fearless we and that's why I said I, 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 I'm an aspiring young woman. We're not young anymore in consideration to the rest of them. And if you look at just the last five years, the technological advances have been so phenomenal. I mean, if you travel, and a lot of us, unfortunately, Alhamdulillah, we can travel and we've been abroad, and you look at what they have and it's at their fingertips versus what we're still getting to. So I'm, a, I'm very um, passionate about big data and data analytics. And the fact that it can actually forecast our entire life, it's very scary. So I always say the man in the street doesn't quite understand what technology can do for them, first of all. Secondly, guys, it's not expensive. It's open source. Just Google open source. And mommy, Google and the internet is not the same thing. (laughs) So yes, it's simple things. It's just about awareness. It's about definition and, and empowering yourself with knowledge I mean, we as muslims are always saying go back and read the quran we always saying look at sunnah um, but there's one thing i do want to say be aware of fake news and that's something i think um our, our parents and and our elders struggle with because they read everything and then they forward everything mm-hmm. it's so important to understand the root of where the information is coming likewise when you hear hadith you will say but where did you get it from what's the source mm-hmm. same application to back you know, use your basics as a Muslim to what you're actually doing with this thing. Because it will really define who you are, how you plan your day, how you see where you need to be. Um, and I think the youngsters of today have figured it out. They're innovative. They're born differently. They, they just, their fingers. I mean, there's been studies that say that their hands are slightly different in terms of how they now, because it, it, I don't know. All I know is best. So... They, they just understand technology and it's, it's a part of them. We have to figure it out. It's a bit more daunting sometimes. Is, is the field, of, I mean, making assumptions, but is the field a, a female-dominated field or not at all? So first, so first of all, it's not at okay. all. Um, it's not also a transformed uh, field. Um, we, so I often come and talk into a room. Um, I'm the only female. I'm the youngest of the lot. Uh, the only Indian Muslim, um, like I say, most of the time the only female, and then the guys would sit there and then they wait for me to bring them coffee. It's not going to happen. Mm. So <laughs> I usually go and sit in the, <laughs> in the chair, oh, yes. chair versus chair, and then I'm like, okay, we're going to start. And nationally, because I'm quite OCD, yeah. I take notes and I chair and do everything. So they assume minutes need to come their way. Okay. I'm also not technical. So it makes it very hard for us women to hold our own in a environment of this nature. And you'll see there's so many women um, driven programs. You've interviewed so many um, young women, driven women in the technology um, space mm-hmm. over the past um, almost two years, two years, mm-hmm. Shalom? Yes. Um, and three years, wow, mashallah, <laughs> Mubarak. <laughs> and it, we just need a lot more. Mm-hmm. Women are not coming through the sciences. Mm-hmm. They're not understanding the world of IS and IT. They're not, all they need to do is do small courses. You were talking to me earlier about um, Shamima, who's a junior developer with us. And Shamima (laughs) says, you know, for me, the fact is at at Shamima's age, and she's a lady, a young professional, she said, I can go back and code. The one thing we forget is coding is just logic. If you can add one and one, and you know how it got to two, I can't do that. It's really hard because <laughs> maths is not my strong point. Khalil, you might know this. But anyone can do it. Mm. 
we need to, um, and I appeal to parents out there, encourage your girls to get involved in technological programs. There are free coding programs, there are things around cyber security, there are things explaining what big data is, and also around the new professions that's going to happen. Old professions and the way we're doing things, traditional universities, it's changing and it's not going to wait for us to make that change. You mentioned something very potent to me. The future is very different. Um, what does the future workplace look to you? How does that future So I kind of love the future workplace mm. every day because I don't have an office and I don't have work times. I do, but I don't really. Okay. Right? And I've got projects throughout the country. So I often I travel almost weekly, which is very exhausting. Although I actually can just pick up the phone and say, guys, let's just do a WebEx. <laughs> you know, let's just do a Zoom. Someone thought Zoom was something very inappropriate the last time and I actually had to tell her no it's like a Skype and there's so many of these free tools that we can now use mm. I, I, I love in coffee shops so I've spent the last two years literally having coffees with almost everybody and anybody to understand the South African economy and the landscape of skills development not because I'm a skills expert just because I'm bus <laughs> it's been interesting and this is why I know a lot of the people that Halil has interviewed because I've met these interesting amazing and wonderful people so the whole world of business is changing. We don't have to sit in traffic two hours every single day. Save the time, but I'm saying use it smartly. You can be at home for your work. You can spend time with your kids. And you actually work harder, but you work smarter. Oops. <laughs> yeah, that was, sorry about that technical glitch. Um, <laughs> Technology failed me there, <laughs> all the batteries. Now. I do apologize for that, but Ferrana is still here and Aisha is still there and we'll carry on, my apologies. Um, just coupled with that, you know the traditional professions um, you mentioned now, you touched on your aunts in terms of future jobs that have not been created in that regard. Parents, uh, would they be hesitant to, should they be hesitant to, to, to allow their kids to come say, Mom, Dad, I want to do whatever this new job is out there. What advice do you have to parents in that regard? Doctors, lawyers, engineers, it, it's always. Uh, my sister's a junior doctor in Bloemfontein. First of all, it's a horrifying experience every single day knowing that my baby is out there alone. There's no electricity half the time, there's no water half the time, and the challenges that they face. Yes, we do need doctors, please don't misunderstand me, but the environment is different and it's changing. And we keep thinking that that's just what our kids need to do. But we're not understanding that the world is really changing. So if you go and do your research, everything in life is about research. Before you cook a meal, I don't cook, my husband does. He cooks really nice. But before <laughs> you cook a meal, go and research. That's what you're going to do. Before you go and travel, what do you do? You go research. Before you want to send your child to school, what do you do? You go research. So why are we not keeping up with what is good for a good career? Not just about what makes money, because what you think makes money within five years' time, that's what I said, I use the five years' timeline. Think about how much has changed. Google Maps has made a phenomenal change in five years. Um, Amazon, who's now based here, the amount of work that Amazon is doing, the amount of jobs and the growth, Microsoft, these are just some of the big companies at the top of my head, Google. The entire landscape on how they have careers and are changing skills development, the curriculum is changing. We're no longer doing three-year-long degrees. They're doing short courses to empower, enable, and move. And I want to really beg all parents, if you're skeptical, have a coffee with me. I will pay for it. We'll go to a liquor place and we'll have a discussion. And let me show you the facts. And then you decide. Because we need to inform our children. You know, most of the times our kids go and do a, law, a lawyer's degree. Are there lawyers in the room? Someone's rolling their eyes. I didn't do my so research for you. Mark said I didn't do no, my no, research. No, 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 but no. anyway. I, I'll, I'll follow up what you're going to say with something else. But you're not always happy in what you're doing. And that's part of the challenge. Or oh, in my case, I'm a perfect, I can only speak from experience. I've got a postgrad in public relations. I've never worked in the field. I'm in digital. I'm now saying, actually, I need to go and empower myself. So research is so important. It sounds scary, but everything is as scary as you make it out to be. If you're supporting your child, and if you believe in it, that child is going to make a success. And if they don't, that's also okay. It's Allah's plan. Accept it, then move on. So 
What is a what is a typical day just in your life? A oh, very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> what does it look like? What time you get up? What do you do? Um, because I know, I mean obviously I know that you know you have a team. So I, I know you're saying you work from coffee shops, but you also have a team, like a real so, life people team. So <laughs> okay, so so our model is based on a partnership model. So okay. I'm recently embarking on building a team. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's been me, myself, and I for quite a long time. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll work with a partner and use their team and manage their team to execute a project. Um, okay. Like I say, I hold everything together. Mm-hmm. So I'll find the different experts and say, okay, what do we need to do? Mm-hmm. My day ranges from, and that's what's exciting. I don't go to an office at 8 and sit and wait till 4. I would die. I literally sometimes probably drive the N1 four times. Um, I am between townships all the time, which excites me. It furiates my eldest aunt and my mother and everybody else in my life. Um, yeah, so I, I travel all the time. I'm up in Joburg. I have a project in Pretoria. I have a project in Joburg, which means I need to commute between the two. But it's all about understanding your land- landscape and making peace with what your day is like. Um, like I said, I'm a workaholic, so there's never a dull moment. There's never nothing to do. I can never be bored. Um, I fall asleep with my laptop very often. Um, find myself waking up in my bed, not remembering how I got there. Poor I know I had to shut off the laptop, pick me up, tuck me in. <laughs> um, and most people think it's very unhealthy, but because I thrive on what I do and I love my projects and I love the impact that it makes, and you can hear when I speak, I'm really passionate about it. It drives me. Um, it's important. I have got balance. I I, I, I do cro- I do CrossFit uh, at least three times a week with Bob. So all my Bobbies out there, it's me. Hi. Um, so yes, I do know about balance. Um, you know, for me, eating well is important. Although I had Sally Manjara's biryani for supper, but that's because I couldn't help it. So. Just something that I can sing things. So, so hello, I've, I've, in, I've invited you guys I've to, been have you been there? Did you tell Ellen who you are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the ICANN Center is an interactive community access network. Um, it's a, proven, um, a project that is, has been established by the Western Cape government. Mm-hmm. It is housed in the city of Cape Town and the concept was developed by Navesh Sufo, who is my CEO. So... The ICANN Centre is basically about saying, let's take the super cool centre with all these cool areas. Um, So it was designed with high technology in a township-like area, which is Alsis, which we know is gang infested. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this. It took me a year ago. One of the most difficult thing I've ever had to do in my life, more than getting married, that was like really easy. (laughs) That was fun. Was finding a building to house the ICANN and the Kalicha Bandit Barn. It took me a year and a half. It was literally blood, sweat, and tears. I threatened to camp out of city of Cape Town. I threatened the city manager that I would camp there. If you know me, you know I'm crazy enough to do that. And so the ICANN Center has got high technology. It took us another year to make sure the community owns the technology. When I presented the project to the community, they first of all said, you privileged, why, why are you here? Number one. Number two, why are you bringing us pieces? Our kids don't have food. They are facing stray bullets every day. They've got drugs in our neighborhood. Those are the very people who now understand how technology can enable them to find a job. They have now created um, Wi-Fi access nodes in the community. They've got partners like Sonic Wireless, um, Google, um, all hosting projects for the community by the community. So Llewellyn and Judah and the team, um, you motivate me every day and I, I admire what you do. The center has got its own sound engineering studio. You stand there and you don't know that this is in the center. So all local artists go to the ICANN or just phone phone me, I don't mind. Go and use the studio, Mm. right? They've got a 3D printer. They've got a whole host of different courses that are, they've got bursary programs. So they've got um, basic, um, your basic office training. So basic um, Word and Excel. But they've also got things like coding, web development, um, AutoCAD, I'm just thinking of smart words they taught me I know nothing about. So there's really cool courses. My dad did the intro to, to, uh, to, uh, to Word and, and um, Excel, the mm. IC3. Um, I don't know how much of it he remembers, but it was so <laughs> cute just seeing his face up there yeah. and saying, you know what, he went and he enabled himself. So it's a really cool center. It's one of its kind, the only one in the country, um, being run by a, a local NPO. 
and like I said, it's driven by the community. Um, they ho they host women events. They encourage young um, entrepreneurs to come and enable them with digital training. Um, a big focus on dis disabled dis disabled entrepreneurs as well. Mm -hmm. They run lots of government initiatives. So and they're one of our business partners. So they are based, or do they come out to? They would come out to, in, I know in this Google CS program, for example, CS First program, they'll come out to schools to train. Okay. Um, but yeah, we could always arrange for Tarawat to come and explain exactly what they do. Um, I know Llewellyn always says I can be his voice, but he knows his stuff best. Uh, but it's really, really awesome place in Elsie's. I'm very proud to have been a part of it and still a part of that centre. And then just to add on that, you, you've said to quite a few people that can contact you. How, how would they do that? Because <laughs> you keep saying, just phone me. Or just say, so they can, how do, they how can do give you? me a call or okay. WhatsApp on my number. I don't mind. Um, okay, so it's, okay. yeah, yeah, Halil can put it up. Or yeah. just contact me via email. Halil can put up my details. And then just make a reference to Accidental Muslims because that's also cool. So I know how I'm connecting and where I'm connecting with you. Because it's also about saying, a lot of people ask me, so what is Accidental Muslims? And what did you get yourself into now again? I get that a lot. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> yeah, are, are they accidentally Muslim, you know? Um, and so it's, it's good for people also to learn more about what you do. So for me, it's a, a sharing opportunity. So I want to ask you this question. Sorry, actually, I'm going to cut in here now. You seem to, I mean, from that CV that we read earlier and what you're telling me now, a lot of experiences have defined you or brought you up to this point. What example from any experience do you think expounds the concept of leadership? Is there one that comes to mind? Or? This was not on the list. Eh? So you want me to give you a real life example of... Like something of, like of a practical example. I mean, you're saying you went to Elsie's River. That really uh, stood out for me. Yeah, something like that. I mean, there's a real stories out there that can inspire the, the listeners, the audience out there. Anything on the top of your head? So... There are, there are so many, like you said, you know, when you sit in these, these different um, communities. Um, I remember going out to Kailicha once and coming there and um, we were sitting in, it was like really in the middle of nowhere, I even, wouldn't even be able to take you to this place. Um, and we're sitting in this, this shell environment and these people come in, um, elderly women, gogos that come in and they have an, on, and they have a, an interpreter. Um, and the leadership, for example, for me is twofold. It's one, how they inspired me, but be how my mentors, my CEO, Navish, how he related to them. Um, and just understanding that these people, these individuals have nothing. Okay, first of all, they don't even have an education. You come into this space. Mm -hmm. They're also very religious, so many of them very staunch Christians. And you coming in as a, a young Muslim, there's big language barriers and everything and then just sitting and listening to these women now first of all i don't understand them but body language says so much you can see their leaders in their homes their leaders in their communities their beacons of hope and for them then to explain to navesh and say you know what um it was some big national data pro pr project that they were a part of so where they were responsible was they had to go out and collect all this data right but then they had to give it over and then they didn't know what happened so they were explaining to us and saying, we want to understand what we are part of. We want to know what are we empowering, where is that information going, and what is the differences we're making. Mm -hmm. And I looked at these old women who are old enough to be my grandmothers. I said, that is leadership. That is about saying, I want to set an example. I want to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. I might be old and feel like I'm outdated, but I want to belong. And then Navesh turned around, and he's an absolute darling. Um, he might be listening in, but I have the world of admiration for my boss um, and his wife, Rasigi. And he, he listened to them eagerly. That's all he did. He just listened. He didn't say anything. He just took this in, and he, he observed them. And that, for me, is the other sense, that the flip side of leadership is being inclusive and just listening to what people have to say. You don't have to know the answers. But it's again coming back to that I'm a human, you were human, we actually share blood. Not are you white, are you black, are you Muslim, are you Christian, are you gay, are you what? It's, it's got nothing. It's just about connecting with them and understanding where they were coming from. So that for me was, was something that stood out. Well, In the middle of nowhere with cows all around us and everything else. Eh? Lovely, lovely. Cows can be example of great leaders as well. 
Um, I won't get into that story right now, but uh, long story short is that's exactly an answer I was looking for uh, in terms of a practical example of leadership. Because often people talk about leadership, it's just theoretical, black and white, so to speak. Um, but when you hear these stories from the ground up, I think those are often the stories that go uh, amiss and we, we don't see that sort of value or, or, or value adding uh, perspective that it uh, gives us. So thank you for sharing that. But before we go, if you want to tell us if the crowd out there, whether you're on Instagram there, Facebook over here, <laughs> please like us, wow us, ask questions, tag people that will enjoy leadership, entrepreneurship, and technology. Please, you do that for us, we will press like on your page as well. No problem. <laughs> uh, Aisha, your turn. Um, what is, what do you, what for you, um, probably a very difficult thing to do, but what for you has been the greatest success so far in your journey? It's not difficult for me to answer okay. that. My success is one thing in life, my parents' happiness. If mom and dad are happy, I am as successful as I can be. I can have all the successes in the world. Without that smile, I'm nothing. Beautiful. Okay, let's do okay. that now. Let's, let's, let's. So, so we are. they say an ideal Facebook live interview should be 18 minutes. So we, we're reaching about 18 minutes. So after the lightning round, I'm going to stop the Facebook live. And I'm going to ask people if you want to hear the rest of this interview, you must go to Stitcher or on the iPhone, uh, Apple app, or Pod app, whatever Google you want to call what? Google Podcasts. Google 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 Google. That's where we're going to get the rest of this interview. So we're going to go off Facebook Live now. But before we do that, we're going to give you access to the lightning round. I shall love this round. <laughs> okay, so lightning round is basic. It's, it's, it's not difficult questions. Okay. You're just going to answer as quickly as possible. Whatever comes at the top of my head. Okay. Yes. Okay, bismillah. Okay, don't come down. It comes, come out wrong. Okay, okay so um, it's basically completing a sentence. Okay. So Allah is? Amazing. Love is? Anwar. Oh, so cute. The world needs <laughs> happiness. <laughs> Happiness yeah. is my parents' smile. Success is my my life. Being a Muslim to you means um, uh, peace, respect, love, happiness, and kindness. Leadership is setting an example and being inclusive. Okay, and Islam to you is being who I am. It's a part of me. I guess I'd say everything. I have a habit of saying I feel like I'm the most blessed person I know. Alhamdulillah. I've got 10 fingers, 10 toes. I can't show you now, but they're all there. Mm. Um, I've got a loving husband. I've got an amazing family, a great support structure. I've got a, an education. I've got work. I've got a home. I've got food. We've got everything. We're sitting in this environment. We've got a mosque that's right here. There's a restaurant. There's a library. There's a school. We're blessed. What more can we ask for? Of all projects that you've worked on, what have you so far identified as uh, as a gap that you that you've yet to tackle? There's a these two, mm -hmm. very big. Mm -hmm. The first one is skills development. I think there's a huge challenge in our economy around skills development. We are training for the sake of training with no real outcome. We don't understand what that pipeline is. So first of all, you will go and train 100 plumbers and you're like, now what? So that's the first thing. I want to ha look at how we can in have informed training, not just for the sake of training, so an entire placement program. I'm very passionate also about monitoring and evaluation. So saying, okay, let me train you in, let's just say, co a coding program. And now you start your journey. And now we place you. But you might realize, you know what? Front end is not for me, but back end. I've now recently learned the difference between the two. Back end is what I want to get into. And now you go and you do that. And you further your career. But as you further, you don't forget where you come from. You then become a mentor to someone else. And all of this needs to be captured somewhere. So that's the one thing. The second thing I'd really like to do is um, work on government supply chain management processes because I'm a guru at it. I have written tenders and I have tended for tenders. So I understand it like nobody's business. Um, and that is something that I actually would really like to tackle. Um, how, where and what and when that happens, government be aware. When I decide to knock, I knock hard. So those are my two areas I'd like to, I see a gap 
but I think would make a big difference. I don't believe government really supports small businesses. I think they make it very difficult. There are lots of opportunity, but we don't know how to access them. You also said that people are training for the sake of training, or they're studying for the sake of studying, yeah? because they were brainwashed to believe you go, you get a degree. Not just that. No, no, no. So like currently right. there are lots of learnerships, Mouth to cut you there. Yeah, There's lots of learnerships that's on, on being offered. Do you know what the scary part is? These individuals just jump from learnership to learnership to learnership because of the stipend. No one is tracking that they're actually taking opportunity from other people away. No one is tracking that there's absolutely no growth in this process. No one is tracking that they're not going back into or are going back into a pipeline. That's just one example I can use off the top of my head. There's so many others. The flip side of it is some of the, the training program, the learnerships, they'll sit for a year and they'll do it. And then there's no certificate for the child. So where's the money going? Again comes down to fraud and corruption unfortunately mm -hmm. so that's what i'm saying it, there needs to be watertight mechanisms to monitor this and i do believe that technology can do that mm -hmm. to combat the fact that coming back to the, to the point that you've mentioned that uh, students are, are training because just for the sake of it right don't you think that at high school level already they should be coaching or career advice they, sh they has to I, um, I do know that they have LO, I believe, life orientation, right? But from what I understand, I'm not a parent. It's not yeah. substantial, and now there's a whole lot of other new debates that are coming forth. Mm -hmm. You can't also give career gu guidance if you, the career guidance teacher is not informed, first of all, which is part of the challenge. Um, career guidance also needs to come from people who've been in a career. So I do believe in career days, you know, I, and twofold. It needs to be from... If I'm a technologist, mm -hmm. I need to come and tell them what I'm doing in my field, but I also need to say, Khalil, you're studying IT, you come and tell them how your first year or your second year is. Mm -hmm. There's two parts to it. So we do need more programs. I know the education department is looking at opening up um, different types of, um, let's call it, say, for example, Microsoft programs or SAP programs or um, accounting programs, and we've been a part of some of them as well. But it's going to take time. Again, change is scary, change is new. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you, we have to change it from the grassroots. We actually can't even come at high school level. You've got to start at your ECD centers and start building in technology and start building in how children see things and understand things to help them guide them in making the right decisions. Wow. Easier said than done, I know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have any favorite chronic verse? So for me, Surah Yusuf, um, because it embodies um, his, his, his virtue, um, although my ultimate favorite would have to be the Qasida Burda, especially when it's rendered by Maulana um, Tahir Ahmed. Um, I absolutely fall in love when he, when he renders it. Um, and whenever my husband sees him, I make him ask him to say it again for me. So yeah, that for me, it, it resonates very closely to me um, and reminds us just of the power of our creator and that miracles are possible in everyday lives for everyday humans. Okay. Um, I feel like that one. <laughs> um, what, um, what advice would you, would you give to, to the youth? And I think you, you touched a little bit on parents already, um, but what, if they would only give to you and say to the youth, what would it be? Just believe in yourself. And when I say believe in yourself, what I've realized is life is a journey about actually finding out who you are. Embrace that journey. Boys, if you want to cry, cry. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Girls, if you want to go and move that table, go move it. Your back will pain the next day, but you can move it. So for me, it's about being yourself. Help your family understand who you are and help them to embrace that because it's very important. Um, remember your values, your Islamic values, but I, I firmly believe that all our religions actually preach the same value system. Nobody tells us to be disrespectful and not to um, share love. So my message out there is just be yourself. Embrace it with your all. Guide others to love you for who you are. And most importantly, be selfish. Because you can only help others if you are able to help yourself. Mm -hmm. You need to put yourself first, be strong enough, and then you can go out there and save the world. It's possible. I actually just, um, earlier asked you about being a female in a male-dominated 
they said you 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 gave an example of you know walking in yeah. what how do you what are the you use with that how do you actually um, deal with it so I guess in my case it would be different I mean we're all unique um, mm-hmm. because I'm so feisty and hard and nobody can tell me what to do helps the situation but it, it, I said it so many times in this interview I research like crazy I was 19 when I started in government and I started out in the tourism sector which back then was still very quite quite a white sector and I'd mm-hmm. come into a boardroom like I said and it is quite intimidating but if I sat down and I opened my mouth I confused them because I knew what I was talking about. Not because I'm smart. It had nothing to do about it, intelligence. But I informed myself. So always research. Even if you're an intern, if so, if your boss tells you to go make a photocopy, read that document. Then you ask questions and then you go research what you read. Stay informed all the time. Empower once you feel empowered, nobody can take that away from you. No matter who they are, no matter how how um racist they are no matter how political they are if you empower it and you believe in it no one can take it away from you um and then i'm so sorry i'm to ask you also <laughs> no, i look at you and then i just continue um you made mention of a mentor earlier yes um are there any other mentors and why is so, so navesh i guess is my mentor not because he's only my, my he's my ceo but because of his personality. Um, he's brilliant, he's smart, he's patient. I've worked for him for five years and I know him for over a decade. So that in itself, he should get an accolade for. <laughs> um, you know, he has the patience to, to mentor someone. He has to impart his knowledge. And that takes, I take my hat off for anybody who wants to do knowledge transfer. It's what we need in this world. We all need to teach each other something and embrace whatever someone wants to teach you. It's their life experience, respect it. So that's why he's my mentor. Uh, my role models are my parents because I understand the difficulties that they've had mm-hmm. raising us as um, children and still always reminding us where we come from. And that I make to that no matter where I go in life, I don't forget that. That it's okay for me to go with the cleaner and clean the toilet and have a conversation. There's nothing wrong in it. Um, I would have to say, um, I don't, say it often enough but I would say my husband is a mentor because I don't know anybody with as much sabr as him for so many reasons which I do not have to say <laughs> um, but you need to live with your mentor to be inspired every day life is hard when you open the news and you read the stories that you read you read what's happening to the children to the women it is so disheartening um, and so you need to find people that can make you feel good about what is actually there. And he says to me, you are so negative. And I say, I'm a realist. And then he actually teaches me a lesson. Yeah. I wish you could, you could be part of this interview the amount of time she, <laughs> she made reference to. <laughs> um, anyone else? How do you balance your life between work and being a mother? I'm not a mother, oh, first of all. I might have missed that. Then. Inshallah, but not yet. Um, although I have many children and my own toys at home, I do share them, but no one can take it home. They're my toys. <laughs> um, balance is easy. Uh, it's taken me a very long journey to make sure that I am a holistic individual. So physically, mentally, spiritually, um, and emotionally, I'm in sync. I know when something is out of sync. So it's been going through therapy through over years, it's been connecting with my creator, it's been understanding my body, um, a whole host of different things that make up Farana. Um, and so balance for me, most people think I'm completely unbalanced for so many reasons, but purely because I work the way I work. I can do three to four days with no sleep, no food, just work straight, just tea. And I mean, occasional hour in the hour, fall asleep, but I can, I've done it. And people say, but that's nuts. But like I said, it's what drives you. Your balance and my balance is different. But you need to know where to draw the line. So I will say, I'm reaching burnout. I need to stop. And I will put my phone off if I need to. Although um, I must admit, over the last few months, it has been a lot harder than usual. So recently I, I, I went on a holiday and um, snuck my laptop in my overnight bag on my way to Turkey. And then Anwar discovered my laptop was in my bag. And let's just say the laptop didn't go with me. <laughs> So balance is you have to get all of those areas in sync. You have to figure out how your body works. You have to understand yourself spiritually. And, and that's different to religion. 
You need to really connect with your creator and with yourself in a very different way. And then you need to understand your emotions. Like I said, if I'm depressed, it's okay. Make a dua, get a hug, go scream on a mountain, go work out and do box jumps. Mm -hmm. Cool. And what keeps you motivated? The fact that I wake up every day is enough to keep me motivated. There's so much to do. There's so much rules to break and disruption to create. You know, I, I believe I believe in chaos. There's method in my madness. And if you believe in what you, you want to achieve and you're doing it for the right reasons, in, your, in my heart, I would like to believe it's for the right reasons. I don't want to harm anybody. I really want to do good or I believe it's good. Then just wake up and do it. My problem is I don't sleep. But inshallah, I'll get there when I'm big. <coughs> so you're a disruptor. You enjoy chaos with a good intention. Um, question to you is that, was there any resource available to you? Maybe let's say in your formative years, formative years, students maybe at school, that you think now has aided you to be the person you are? Lots. So, and I'll be very open and honest, and I am, I, I'm a t you'll see I'll do this often because I'm, I'm OCD, so time is, is, I'm a critical time. So I actually watch your other podcasts and say, what are your time limits on things? Um, but I, I do need to share this, and I'm very open about my life. When I was 14, I was suicidal because both my nana and my khalame were murdered in a period of seven months apart. And I was the family, I've always been the family's um, um, foundation. And at 14, at some point, I just broke. I couldn't anymore. And then I went to what is called William Slater. So I used to go to William Slater. It was, it was a place for sad children. Four days a week. And on Friday, I went to school. And that's where Islands I played a really strong place in my life because I still could manage to pass despite them support, despite going through the support system. And the tools that I was taught there, because I was a very angry child. I didn't understand. I didn't want to live. I didn't understand, you know, why were these people taken away and why are all these things happening and things that young kids go through and a whole lot of other reasons. But there I was given the tools to survive. Where I was taught how to manage emotion. We was taught simple things like throw a ball against a wall. I had to take out the boxing bag for me because I used to break everything and I went for everyone. But it's small things. So when your children are showing signs of anger, signs of depression, signs of sadness, there are tools. And now we're even more uh, blessed because we just go onto a YouTube video and it teaches you what you can and can't do. And you need to do a mix, mixture and a variation because what works for your child might not work for me or my child. So I've, that, was, that was the biggest learning curve for me at Slater. Um, they taught me really how to be the Farana I need to and want to be. They also taught me, believe it or not, how important religion is in my life and that I need to take back who I am. And then it just flourished from there. That's, um, thank you for sharing this. I mean, we, we did, I'm not sure if you saw, we did a, a series beginning of this year, honey, I'll call depression series, and you, you touched on that then. Teenage suicide, all in the same breath, and, 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 and thank you for sharing that. We, and the responses we got to that series mm -hmm. is probably, till today, one of the most watched and talked about uh, or engaged series. So it's definitely a, a, a topic that's out there, and I think your answer provides a little bit of light, a little bit of hope to the audience. I'm sure of that. People, you listening, send your questions, send your likes. Uh, phenomenal, definitely a dynamic guest. I think the, the, the reason why I said that and being dynamic driven. Um, I'm coming back <laughs> to that, yes. <laughs> Living up to that, yes. Um, yeah, did you ask her how to describe herself in three words? I didn't. You didn't? I didn't. Okay. So I say <laughs> dynamic and driven, but I took that off the internet. Maybe you can give us new words to do. Oh, I'm definitely feisty. Okay. Nobody says no to me except I know. I guess that's why I married him. <laughs> um, so, hello, I, I'm still the same, eh? Anyone ever say no to me in high school? No. Yeah, so uh, feisty. So when she wanted to open up the bowling, you said yes? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Well, they always said yes to me. <laughs> I, was, I was a surprise student. I, I tried to get wickets. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm definitely I considered as being quite feisty. Um, I'm highly ambitious um, it, and very passionate. And I think the one thing it's taken me a very long time to accept and, and, and learn about myself is... I'm hardworking. And that for me, I think, is the key to success. <coughs> Just work hard. <coughs> I'm not smart. Because there's all the stuff that you speak about is really difficult for me. Um, I, w I never had 
school books, I actually never went to class. I used to copy from everybody else because the teachers used to tell them, please help for Anna. They felt sorry for me. Picharo. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that took to be me in a nutshell. I think last question for my side, I don't know what you guys want to answer, but earlier today we, 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 we hosted Kutaba Online Academy. Yeah. And given your, your, your background in technology and the digital space, um, do you think that's a, a future schooling system to, to, for your kids or for, for, the, for the future of any society? Learning and educating oneself online. Definitely. We do, however, need to understand what the dangers and parameters are around that and how it fits into our cultural environment. Parents need to first empower themselves. Don't expect your child to go through something if you don't understand what they are about to embark on. I think that's critical. I mean, if I were a parent, I'd actually do that whole schooling system with my child. Mm. Also, I understand cyber security um, because there's a lot that children are exposed to that you might not. I mean, you touched on it, how smart kids are of today. So you need to be extra vigilant, but I do agree with the way things are going in our current education system, with the dangers that our kids are facing at every single day at school. Let's not even get into bullying. It's a whole topic on, topic on its own, and it's happening everywhere doesn't matter what school your child goes to what your background is so I do believe teaching online and learning online is the way to go but there needs to be a balance so there has to be some sort of human interaction there needs to be some sort of class where they all get together and they socialize even if it's once a week um, so it is again you can't just have you and the screen that's actually okay. a good question I think uh, one of the um, the attendees of the earlier uh, event actually asked something to that extent and if you are watching again i think that is an answer that you could use to your question uh, in terms of how uh, online can be a, we can make it a success but it's again it's about empowering yourself and, it's and a tool. being hard working no, it's as a tool. well you need to be open and honest mm. um, it's a tool that enables you that's all technology mm. is it's an enabler mm. it's not the answer it's not the god of everything it's not complicated it's just an enabler. Lovely stuff, lovely stuff. Okay, so... Yeah. Last question? Yeah, Who's last question. Who's going to answer drama? Aisha, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure, go for it. So, it's okay. um, so, just as a final presentation, um, as your, this was your last words to everyone watching out there, so, so what did it be? So, I would first of all want to thank you guys for having me. Uh, Halil, like I said, Halil and I have a, a, a very long friendship um, and I've always admired the work that he's done and the young man that he's grown into. Um, I always see Khalil as a younger brother for some weird reason even though I'm younger than Khalil. So <laughs> in passing I want to ask all of your viewers to please encourage more listeners to like, share, tag, get involved, bring more inspiring individuals to your table so that you can expose them on platforms like these. Get your parents to watch. Show them what a podcast is and in how, teach them how they can engage with the people that's being interviewed with the content that's out there um, i want to just say thank you to all my partners because lots of business partners um, guys please also go out there and like uh, partnership for the digital africa it's our non-profit um, company and then also um this sunday afternoon my dear sister nadia charles is hosting her launch for her non-profit organization collaboration for good so i'm going to use this opportunity while i can <laughs> so thank you guys, Jazakallah, and um, I appreciate the experience. No, brilliant. Thank you for taking your time again. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you for sharing so candidly. And if you guys like this episode, share, like, tag. Also a big thanks to our host, yeah, Ali Ahlas uh, Academy, the library situated at uh, Islamia uh, College uh, Complex. Uh, thank you guys for hosting us here. Thank you for everybody for watching. It's another episode of AccidentalMuslim.com. Assalamu alaikum. Thank <clears throat> you.